contacted me around a year ago, um, was sent through another friend, his daughter, murdered in cold blood. And he comes to you tonight to not only share his story um, in an act of self-preservation, but to, to protect you as well, because your system did not do that. The murderer killed his daughter, admitted to the crime, and even as of today, five years later, still, under your law, is able to walk free, uh, hold a job, go to church. God knows where he's going because at times he's unsupervised. So I'm going to turn over the floor basically um, and, and let my guest, Bill Kanar, uh, lead the way. Bill, you're with me now? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you because what you're doing um, is going to serve many people, um, and they should be here tonight listening, and they should be thanking you, and I hope they're sharing the information around your community. Um, you know, and, and I know this is uh, going to be a tough night, so Bill, I just want you to get in your place. Um, give us as much as you can, and if you need to pause, I have the background information near me. I'll try to fill in the blanks um, as you, uh, if you need to, uh, compose yourself. So, so you know, this is this is your home here, Bill. Um, thank you, and and I'm just going to hand it over to you. As far as taking calls, that will be at your discretion as well. So, if you want to open up a time in the show uh, to to take questions. That's fine. I'm watching the chat room in case any questions come up in there. I'll you know, present them to you at the appropriate time. Uh, but beyond that, um, this is for you and, and for those that, that you're trying to protect. Kevin, I do thank you. Uh, without your abilities, I don't think this story is going to go too much further than what it has. Okay, guys, my name is Bill Kanar, and I lost my daughter at the age of 26. Uh, she had two children by Owen Atley Walker II, which is also the man that killed her. At 2.53 a.m. on February 2nd, 2010, I get this telephone call. The phone kept ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing, and finally I answered it, and Danielle's half-brother, my stepson, tells me that Pardon my language here, folks. The bastard has stabbed your daughter to death. Of course, I lost it. And my significant other took the phone, and I just wailed and wailed and wailed. And at that point, I became so despondent, so large, lethargic, depressed, whatever, whatever tag you want to put on it, and uh, went into depression. Then I started getting on the phone, t trying to get information and talking to the homicide detectives, trying to talk to the Commonwealth's attorney here in Virginia. Uh, anywhere else would be called the district attorney. Uh, the victim's advocacy program, anybody and anybody that uh, was working with this case. Nobody knew I existed until I made myself available to them because of what my ex-wife and her husband uh, how they handled the situation and immediately got custody of my grandchildren. Well, anyway, uh, Owen Walker was incarcerated. He made a confession. He confessed to killing Danielle. He confessed to considering killing the grandchildren. He stabbed my daughter 26 times with a 12-inch hunting knife and then laid on top of her until she bled to death, is the story I get from my granddaughter. Now, he is alleged to have been insane at that time, but then had the presence of mind to clean himself up, clean the knife with bleach, change clothes, put the kids to bed, 
take my daughter's car and go driving around for a while. Then he made this bright decision to turn himself in at the sheriff's department, uh, which is where my ex-wife works, and she was on duty that night. Uh, When I found out that Owen Walker had been physically abusive to Danielle, I had told him that if he continued to do what he was doing, uh, I would use every means available to me that the law would allow. Well, guess what? He and his sociopath with psychopathic tendencies managed to use the law against us. Uh, We went through the court process, and what I began to realize, it kept going from judge to judge to judge to judge, and none of the judges seemed to want to deal with it. So the last judge it went to, he ruled on the case. We, they had two uh, psychiatric professionals rule him not guilty by reason of insanity, or uh, to be insane. They didn't rule him not guilty. The judge ruled him not guilty by reason of insanity. Now what happens in this case is, is he goes to a mental health facility. He will be treated, but he will never be punished. Uh, He originally went to Central State Hospital, which was up around Petersburg, and they deal with more of the criminally insane. Uh, And then about a year, maybe a year or two, 2013, maybe about two years after uh, he went to Central State, he was transferred to Eastern State Hospital, which is in the Williamsburg area, just a few miles up the, the interstate from where we are. Uh, I worked at Eastern State Mental Facility for a good number of years, so I know the bureaucracy. I know how it works. Everything looks good on paper, but what's on paper isn't reality. But it has to be monitored strictly monitored. Now, if they put him out on his own recognizance and he falls through the system, uh, he's going to end up doing what he did again. Uh, A year after my daughter's death, he started posting on Facebook. Now, please understand, I was not searching Facebook to look for him or anything that he was posting, but I get these well-meaning friends and family that would let me know that he was posting these things, and of course I started reading them, and it drove me absolutely nuts. Based on what he was writing, it's still all about him, and no remorse, no guilt, and no anything about his crime. So I reported it to local uh, CBS affiliate. They ran a story on it. Uh, There for a while, his Facebook page disappeared. Uh, But then it came back up under another name here uh, a while ago. And the same reporter ran a story on him in June. And I think that's what uh, Kevin has posted. There's a killer among us that the CBS affiliate had done. Uh, he's had been working at several, uh, eating establishments within Williamsburg. He was working there for a while as a painter and come to find out, I, I believe they wouldn't, they wouldn't 100% tell me this, but he hangs out at, uh, 12 step fellowship meetings. And I already believe he's got his next victim based on what CBS reported. Uh, there were pictures being posted of him with, uh, belt around women's necks and uh, there were pictures they couldn't even post on TV because they were of such uh, a nature that it would not be appropriate. Um, My thing is, is that I want to tell my daughter's story in hopes that it will save somebody's life. Uh, When I knew she was being physically abused, I kept telling her and kept trying to reinforce with her that you know, if she didn't find a way to get out of this situation, that it was going to get worse. It could get worse, and it continually got worse. September 2009 was the last time I physically saw my daughter, and she had come to me because he had left her, abandoned her with no money, no food, no pampers, no nothing for the grandbabies. So I went to the bank and took out the money that I had was for my medications and got her the things that she needed. 
And I told her at that time, I said, Danielle, if you don't leave this guy, there's really nothing more that I can do for you. And you don't know how much that cuts like a knife when I get the telephone call on February 2nd, 2010. That was, you know, in, in, in 2009, that's the last time I saw my daughter alive. As a father, I feel helpless. I feel like I let my daughter down. I couldn't protect my child. Yes, she was 26 or 25. She would have been 26 in August. Yes, she was of age. She made her own decisions. Uh, yes, there was nothing that I could do based on her making her decisions. But still, as a father, I feel like I have failed my child. Uh, what do well, you do? Yeah, I, well, you know, I don't know what you do. I don't think anybody can fathom it until they're in there. Um, but some of the things that y you pointed out, they concern me too. Um, you know, and, and this is the thing. If we're dealing with a murder, this is my opinion. If we're dealing with a murder, cold, I mean, especially this brutal, vicious thing, there's no justification for it. And then we, after the fact, claim mental disability. I don't think it should be allowed. I think it should only be allowed as a documentary of mental health issues. Um, and then in that situation, there should be somebody that's equally as guilty for not keeping the person um, under, you know, supervision or whatever. Um, but that's my opinion. The system says differently, obviously. I, I don't see how we, this happens. Um, you know, and I know from being a father, there's only so much you can tell your kids that some things they just have to um, reason out and, and decide themselves, no matter how much evidence you give them. And sometimes um, there's consequences for that. Yeah. What you're saying about the history of abuse um, is what I read in one of the reports. Um, and now you had mentioned uh, Walker had... Um, targeted his next vis victim, and I believe from what I read that's true, and that man has actually spoken out as well and got the media involved because it's a close friend of him, and the history is repeating itself. She's being beat. She's scared. She, her family has turned away from her because she won't leave him. Um, and now this is a man that should be in prison. He's having an abusive relationship yeah. of some, yeah. of some yeah. fashion, whether it's created in his mind only or not. Um, I don't know, uh, but, you know, this is, uh, I, it, it's very, very disturbing to me, and, and I hope that any of the young gals that are listening to this that are in similar situations, heed that warning and get out. You know, if you're with somebody that truly loves you and you just get out because they're abusive if they truly love you then they'll correct themselves on their own and you'll find them again later in life chances are that's not going to happen that's what the statistics say but Bill and, and myself do not want any of you to be one of those statistics that's why Bill's here tonight so well, you know Bill Kevin domestic violence predominantly is against women however Men, children, and women are all exposed to domestic violence. Men don't talk about it because of their macho man kind of thing. But they do experience domestic violence, and they do experience deadly domestic violence, and so do children. But, of course, my experience is being with my daughter. My daughter kept a lot of the domestic violence from me. I was the last one to know. And I had done uh, a speaking engagement for Samaritan House, which uh, houses and protects and, and tries to, I want to say rehabilitate, that's not the word, uh, domestic uh, battered women. And I spoke at, a, at a, a candlelight vigil they had, and somebody asked me to do a video, and I said yes. And then when, when the video was posted on YouTube, they had posted what Danielle had written on MySpace uh, just before she was killed. And when I read that, it was like, holy crap. 
I mean, I was literally to the point of tears because she was in so far, so deep, and she knew it was going to happen. And at that point, there was nothing I could do for her. Now, I've got people that are constantly after me to take justice in my own hands. What useful purpose would that serve? Yes, he would be uh, no longer here, but then I'd be in prison probably waiting for the lethal injection. And what's that right. do for me and my grandkids? Uh, right. No, you're, you're wise, Phil, because uh, many would be prone to uh, react that way. And you're absolutely right, though. Um, you know, it's uh, it, what, what bothers me, though, is hearing that she knew it was going to happen. There's evidence of that. But yet the, the claim of insanity uh, in the heat of the moment, I have to assume, that's the whole ploy, right? It was the heat of the moment. I, I suddenly became insane. Well, then how did somebody else know ahead of time? Well, here's that, that doesn't fly to me in, a, in, 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 the, in the courtroom. If I'm a judge, I'm going to hear both those points, and I'm going to say, well, he couldn't have been insane because she knew it was going to happen, so he had to have known. You know what I mean? I, I just yeah. I, Well, here's, here's the thing, and here's what law enforcement had to work with. They only had his side of the story to work with because Danielle was dead. Right. So that's the story they worked with. Now, when the homicide detectives finally got in contact with me, uh, what they began to uncover was uh, a documented history of mental uh, issues. And no good deed goes unpunished. I hate saying that. There was a point in time my daughter called me. She was all frantic. Owen was alleged to have taken an overdose of some medication and drinking wine heavily. I told her to call 911. She refused to do it because of repercussions. I got the name, number, social security number, date of birth, address, all of that stuff. I called 911. I got the guy the help that he needed. Then... After he kills my daughter, he's on the news doing his interview, blaming the system, how the system failed him. The failed system didn't fail him. He abused and used the system to uh, uh, do what he wanted to do. And, you know, it really kind of just tears at my heart because, you know, as, as a compassionate human being, and, and being compassionate towards other people, I called 911 to get this guy the help that he needed, or I thought he needed. Well, later I found out he took an overdose of uh, ibuprofen. It probably wouldn't have killed him, but it would have severely damaged his liver. So what did I uh, actually start doing there? I started creating the paper trail for his mental instability. And that's what they were starting to work with to eventually have him ruled by uh, the judge based on two psychiatric professionals uh, evaluations not guilty by reason of insanity well you know if we're going to set those kind of standards then there's going to be a lot of people walking free for a lot of crimes with the drug addiction that's in this country if they're going to relate addiction and depression to mental insanity and, and a valid reason for murdering someone then I don't know what's next quite honestly I mean, it just, the whole thing stinks to me, you yeah. know, uh, it, it really does, because I see good people being, and you do, I know you, you watch the news, you're, you're aware of what's going on, we see people thrown in prison, uh, you know, for things like possessing plants, uh, yeah. not harming anybody, you know, and so, and then we have this guy, um, and, and we see you know, and even if you could justify the sentence um, and the finding of the court and all that, even I want people to really listen to the point. The behavior is repeating itself, and this man is unsupervised at times. This, this can't happen. Uh, another set of eyes, another court for, for some reason. You know, I mean, they create laws every time they want to do something, right? Uh, th- there must be a law in place, uh, and, and hopefully Craig Kirk, maybe he's listening in tonight and has some ideas, or he'll he'll look into this after the fact. Um, because th- th- somebody needs to now. I, I do understand he was up for parole, and they didn't 
grant his parole. Um, but that's not a punishment um, because you, you're sentenced and parole is just um, a gift if you get it. So it's not like he's being repunished for the crime, um, but he's still not being held at a, at a, a standard that's going to keep the community safe. Yeah, uh, well, nothing has changed. Technically, it's not parole. It's release into the community because now his mental uh, issues are manageable. Yes, they are manageable. Having worked in the mental, inst mental health facility uh, industry, what happens is, is these guys get released into the community. Uh, you know, they're doing well. They're taking their medication. They get to a point where they stop taking their medication because they feel okay. Because some of these drugs that manage these people have some severe side effects. And there are other medications that has to be taken to counteract the side effects. And then when they stop taking their medication, they're right back or, or swiftly uh, becoming right back where they started from. Now, this guy went to, an, uh, to a 12-step fellowship meeting, I believe AA, but, you know, I, I should keep that, you know, anonymous kind of thing. And he's got what I consider his next victim. She doesn't see it that way. Other people are really concerned for her. I don't know who she is. Uh, you know, that was just based on that news story that uh, CBS had done back in June. Um, you know, and, and I believe that it's the next victim because, you know, uh, they had pictures posted where a belt was around the female's neck. So that's the uh, erotic asphyxiation kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, he's got his next victim. And if they don't severely monitor this guy and do something else with him, uh, he's going to kill somebody else. And then who's responsible for that? The people that treated him or him? Not him, because he's not guilty by reason of insanity. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I don't understand, you know, the whole thing. And I know how, you know, some women, they'll justify anything the man has done in the past and always change and all these things. You know, we've lived, we, we've heard all this nonsense. But um, do we have any way of knowing if she knows all the facts? or uh, well, Because if she, if she knows all the facts um, and she's still you know, putting herself in that situation, then she needs some mental health help as well. It's what, a, that's starts, cool. <laughs> what, starts, what starts happening is, is that this guy is, you know, going to, you know, be all nice and lovey-dovey, and then he's going to start his control mechanisms. He's going to start, start isolating her from her friends. He's going to start the total control thing. Now, with Danielle, I believe that her fear was he kept threatening the kids through her, my grandkids or her children. And that was the only reason she kept doing what she was doing, because he kept threatening the kids. Can I prove that? No. But I believe that. I also believe that she had finally had enough and told him that she was leaving. She was going to go to Florida. She uh, was going to finish. Uh, she was going to get her, uh, uh, crap, bachelor of science degree. She already had her associates. And there was a possibility that she could start working with Pixar down in Florida. And she was ready and willing to move to Florida. She said, you can go, you can stay, it doesn't matter, whatever you want to do, but I'm going to Florida. And then that's what set him off because he believed at that point he no longer had control. Well, I, I don't know. The whole thing is concerning to me. What do you, Now, you have a little bit of... Um, a background in private investigation and that kind of stuff, and, and you've done a bunch of research. Um, is there anything out there that documents uh, that the public has access to? Uh, you know, what his schedule is, so people at least know when he's coming and going, what nope. he's doing. Does nope. he have to report that schedule to anybody? Uh, well, the mental, uh, the mental facility is supposed to report that to the Commissioner of Health and the, and the Commonwealth's Attorney and Victims Advocacy. And the victim advocates are supposed to notify the, the family of the victims. That doesn't happen all the time. Now, I had an I had elderly lady that uh, just retired. She was the sweetest person. She was the most fantastic person because she kept me advised of everything that was going on. Now, she's retired. 
And I don't know who the victim's advocate is that would be handling that. Because now it's 2015. This happened 2010. It's a closed case. Right. Yeah, and, they, and you you had the disadvantage, of it, so that uh, the listeners know, um, you had the disadvantage of ha- having been in a divorce, so that kind of kept you out of the loop or made some of these people feel like they didn't have to cooperate with you fully or keep you fully informed through this. So if you've had to fight pretty much for every bit of information about this uh, from day one. Once, once everybody knew that I existed and they got over the initial shock, everybody was more than willing to uh, you know, assist me in any way possible. The original Commonwealth's attorney, she retired, she moved on. Uh, the victim's advocate, she retired. So now none of the people that worked the case originally are around. So the people that are now in position have no clue. All they got is what's on paper. You know, they didn't physically work the case from beginning to, you know, whatever stage it got. So all they have is what's on paper. They don't have... Uh, let's call it their personal feelings, their personal emotions involved in this, because this does affect many people in many different ways. And now that I don't have that support mechanism, uh, you know, I'm trying to call to find out who the victim's advocate is now that's handling this, because they are supposed to advise the family when he comes up for a reevaluation. And right now it's every June, every year. Uh, you know, he can be. Uh, released to the community like Hinckley has. Uh, you know, of course, the difference between you know my daughter and Hinckley is is Hinckley comes from money, and <clears throat> I come from working my butt off all my life and s- struggling to survive. Um, but he can get extended weekend visits. He can get uh, you know extended outings. That's the sixth stage in permissions. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to take after his last episode on Facebook. <coughs> Facebook is what's keeping him in trouble, which I'm happy for because, you know, then that, you know, we, we know what's going on. Um, you know, my only concern, I have two concerns. My primary concern is my grandchildren because he did make a confession that he considered killing those kids. Uh, and my second concern is for some other woman, child, uh, somebody else's family member that could fall prey to this insidious monster that's out there. But yeah, well now the kids now uh, that you've mentioned them, they are now what six and eight or somewhere thereabouts. Yeah, yeah, just about. Uh, I think uh, Zeppi turned six in September. And Johnny will be eight in March. And, and, and when this happens, how are they? How, how are they now? I mean, it, well, this they're, must be... they're they're well balanced. They're uh, extremely intelligent. They're all in accelerated uh, classes and stuff. Uh, my ex-wife and and her husband are doing a fantastic job of raising those kids. I've got no complaints with that. Uh, although you know we butt heads because of, of differences in philosophy on uh, theological issues. Um, and of course, you know, that's always going to be a factor. And her husband tries to plant these seeds in my head that, you know, I need to take justice in my own hands. And of course that I go through the roller coaster ride and the depression and all of that crap. Uh, you know, and that's just a, a, a manipulative, manipulative ploy on his behalf to keep me all screwed up. And I don't see the kids. Cause I don't right, want to yeah, see that's them. not, you know, really in this situation, this should be a situation uh, where he doesn't, you know, he certainly would have involvement with with the children, while, uh, obviously, but as far as issues uh, on what's best for the children, I mean, it, it's my opinion that that should fall solely on you and your ex-wife to make those decisions, you know. Um, I've been, I've been no part of those decision makings, it's just my ex-wife and her husband. Um, now, does she is she pretty fair about you know visitations or and that kind of thing? Or I mean, because it, if you're not getting to see your grandkids, then they're being punished for their mother being killed, and that really anyone that would do that, uh, you know, needs. Yeah, needs all to I have to do is call and make. All I have to do is call and make the arrangements and say okay. I want them for the weekend if if they haven't already been scheduled through 
their uncle or somebody else or some other event they got coming up, if they're free, yeah, I get to see them. Oh, that's awesome. And so some of the other family is interacting with them as well. Yes, yes. But it took right. me at one point taking them to court because, you know, I wanted uh, a structured visitation. You know, because when when the when the court proceedings were going on, uh, my ex's husband came up to me at the final hearing when he was ruled not guilty by reason of insanity. Before that uh, determination was made, he pulled me outside the courtroom, and he says, he says, you know, every time uh, we get the kids back from you, they always come home sick because of dogs and cigarette smoke and yada, yada, yada. Well, that set me off. Uh, and then I go into court to listen to this other stuff going on, with not guilty by reason of insanity, and if it wasn't for the victim's advocate, God knows what I would have done. She came, she saw that I was distressed, and she asked me to step out of the courtroom, and we talked for a little while, and I told her what had happened, and she had shaken her head and said, why would he want to do that to you at a time like this? And um, so, you know, it, this has not been an easy road. <laughs> no, I'm sure. I'm sure it's not. Um, you know, and that's. I mean, just based on on the fact that you're going to, in some ways, relive this situation every time uh, you even think about those kids. Look at a picture of them or your dog, or have a visit with them. You know, um, and then to have to deal with that type of uh, uh, crap. You know, with the the ex-wife's new husband, uh, whatever the case is. I, I'm sure. Um, you know, I was married once, and so I, I kind of get that part of it because th there's an automatic thing where you want to punch the guy, even if he's a nice guy. You know what I mean? And if he's not a nice guy, then the so you got all this stuff going on. Um, I, I'm sure the kids, uh, they were pretty young, but I'm sure still there was uh, a lot of counseling involved, and, and maybe still is. Yeah, uh, still is for Johnny. Johnny was three at the time. And she remembers it to this day. She'll catch me off guard. You know, we'll be driving down the road, you know, going someplace, and then, <laughs> excuse me, out of the blue, you know, she'll start talking about it. And it's like, okay, I listen. And if she has questions, I answer the questions. <coughs> but I don't keep it going. If she's satisfied with the answer, then that's where it stays. Uh, you know, I don't want to perpetuate it, so I'll let her ask her questions, and I don't want to ask her any questions in return because I don't know what's going on in her therapy. I don't know, you know, if I'm going to set something off or whatever. But if she asks, I answer. Um, but she remembers to this day, and, you know, she'll, like I say, she'll be eight in March. Well, that's what? pretty uh, pretty fair-handed way to, way to do it, Bill, because, yeah, you have to be there for her, but you can't push the issue. What I'm worried about is, see, my ex-wife suffered from, severe post-traumatic stress and after she had our youngest son that took a hold all those visions and all those mental health issues that she had kind of repressed and hid for many years came out full force um, and just destroyed her life marriage and the whole deal and so that's where I have a concern you know or a red flag in my mind because these kids are out there and especially if you say the oldest remembers um, you know, and she's doing well, and that's awesome. Um, it sounds like she's got a, a fair shot. But this guy's out there, and she could be going through town one day, and he could be walking the other way, or she could and have to relive all of that. It just doesn't – it seems like everybody else is still being punished uh, yeah. for the actions of this guy. Yeah. And he, he's just – you know, now he has to report back by a certain time. But in my thinking, this – should be no less um, than what we would do with a sex offender, that they're put on a map, that everybody in the community that they live in and work in are put on notice. Uh, somebody needs to be going around those towns putting up flyers on every telephone pole. Um, you know, employers, people need to keep an eye on this guy. If, if you see he's working somewhere, you need to question the employer. Do you know he's guilty of murder? Do you, do you, you know? Um, and I actually, when you had first approached me on that, um, was just after Walker had quit, I think, the Kentucky Fried Chicken, or maybe it was, you know, six months or whatever, because it's been a while, but I called them, and, you know, um, 
that they were very hesitant to answer any questions as far as, you know, did you, did you know? And, you know, they just kind of shut me off that he doesn't work here anymore. Right. They didn't want, they didn't want to answer whether they knew, um, they didn't want to tell me whether he was a good employee. Um, they didn't want to tell me anything other than he used to work here. They did confirm that. Um, right. But yeah, so but he went on to other jobs. It seems like. Um, yeah, he's gone on to Burger King. Then he w ended up working painting for somebody in a twelve-step fellowship, and that didn't work out. Uh, you know, my my knowledge of his work history is not very good. He's not been able to manage to hold out a job for very long anywhere. Um, you know, throughout the time that I knew him, or knew of him, uh, he was deathly afraid of me. My daughter had him afraid of me. Uh, I met him once or twice. I came over to the house once or twice, uh, and he was extremely afraid of me, which was fine. Um, right. You know, we, that's your daughter. He should be afraid of you, <laughs> you know. Um, that's my talked, opinion, you know. Yeah, we talked for a while. He seemed like a decent guy at that point. Uh, me not knowing about the domestic violence, had I known about it, I would have uh, dealt with him extremely differently. Um you know, every time my daughter would disappear, she'd disappear for two, three, four months at a time. And when she disappeared, I knew that she was under his control. And then once she got to where, you know, she was comfortable with doing what she was doing, uh, you know, she'd show up. I'd see her, you know, a couple of times a, a week or, you know, a couple of times a month and, you know, real happy, real upbeat, real positive. But never once did she discuss with me the, the physical abuse. When I began to know about the physical abuse, uh, her mother, her, my ex-wife, her husband, and I, and her brother went and moved her out of the apartment they were living together in, and then she stayed with her mother for a while. <clears throat> and then that's when I told him that if he ever did anything to her, I'd use every means available to me that the law will allow. Um, and I could see his gears working. I could see his mind working. And I'm saying to myself, ah, this ain't good. This is not good. You know, having, having observational skills, not only from the mental health uh, profession, but being a private investigator, something just did not sit well in my gut. And I knew there was going to be issues. So I started working hard on Danielle. We almost had her away from him. Uh, but because of my relationship with my daughter, she believed that her children should have a relationship with their father. And that was the, the hook. It, it, is a, uh, it is a tough call, I'll tell you. It's a, it, it is. There's always something there. As a single parent, you know, my ex did all kind of things. Um, but I still, uh, you know, have always tried to work for some communication between her and my kids although that's their choice and they choose not to right now. Right. Um, but there is um, that natural, oh, my God, I had children uh, and I intended them to always have both parents. And so, yeah, you kind of do get hooked um, from that. And but, but what strikes me as funny is you would mentioned, you know, your daughter being upbeat. And from what I read, that was her nature, that, you know, she was an upbeat, happy person. Her, her friend uh, Nicole had said that anywhere she went, she found a friend. And then I look at, you know, I think about what Walker did. I hear what you say the history was. And then I just look at his face in that one photograph, and he looks mean. Yeah. And, he, and, he, and, he, and he, you know, he looks, there's evil in there. And, and it's, you know, um, you kind of have to wonder how such a happy, uh, secure woman would fall prey to somebody that just simply looks mean and evidently was uh, very, very early on in their relationship he has a daughter from another relationship and there was his hook because he'd show up in the malls and uh uh starbucks and all these places you know to meet women and he'd have his little girl with him and you know that was that was a magnet if you want to call it that. My daughter fell into that magnet, you know, little girl, little daddy. She knew what we went through, uh, you know, and, and so that tugged at her heartstrings. She tried doing what she could for the girl, but it reached a point where, you know, he wanted her to stay at home and take care of his kid, 
uh, and not provide or do anything for his child, but Danielle was taking care of his child, and she put her foot down. And from what I understand, afterwards there was a big knockdown drag out over that because she wasn't going to, you know, be the physical mother for that child when he wasn't supporting the child. But that's how he hooked her, and that's how he's hooked several other women. I don't know how old uh, Azrael is now, uh, so that's what five years ago, and then uh, she's probably fifteen, sixteen. So I don't know if that's going to work. But, uh, yeah, he used that, and I'm looking and I'm thinking, uh-huh, Danielle, be careful. Danielle, please be careful. And, and to, you know, to the listeners out there, please forgive me. I don't mean to be rude or disrespectful. I've always kept my da- told my daughter, I said, Danielle, don't let any man ever put you in a position to where you have to sacrifice your dreams and desires. There is far better dick out there than what you're getting now. So, you know. Right. Yeah. No. That's I, that's one thing I always like about you, Bill. You're not afraid to tell it like it is. And you know, that's sometimes I know as a dad with with kids, you know, you have to be that upfront, real, and firm with them because you know after you've uh, begged and pleaded and had conversations for so long, and you see them failing and going in a dangerous direction, um, you really have to just say, Hey, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. You know, I, I love you, and you're going to destroy yourself, and you've got to stop now. And, you know, sadly, uh, sometimes they don't listen. And, you know, I, I know, I can't speak, obviously, from the female perspective, but I know that just creating a child with another person, you know, made that bond between her and I that no matter what she did, um, I would try to fix it. Hold it together because those kids deserve two parents in the home, and that's a, a destructive path in itself. Even though yes. it's you know it's road to hell is paved with good intentions, as they say. Yes. Um, it, it's very very destructive, and if you are prone to go in those type of directions, even after you end it or it is ended, you for a long time will still yearn for that abusive. Uh, life. It's not the, you know, you'll still think about, oh man, if I had done this, it, and even after to to think about it, unfortunately, in this situation, you know. Um, yeah, what if I would have done this, what if I would have done that? Maybe if I would have right. tried this, maybe if I would have tried that. You know, I know for women in the domestic violence situation, it's it's a lot tougher for the men because women become dependent on men as being the providers, so the women are at home trying to take care of the kids, raise the kids, and, and, you know, do whatever. And then the guys are supposed to be doing the providing or whatever. They, they may or they may not. And then when it gets into the domestic violence situation, then they take that uh, providing away. And there's where the fear comes in for the women. And, you know, they're controlled by the fear. The fear of what if he leaves me? What if he leaves me abandoned? What am I going to do? I got these kids. I got this. I got this. I got this. You know, and and once, 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 and, and I don't want to say this for just women, but once you get to a point where you're no longer looking at the fear uh, and step outside of that, yes, it's scary. Uh, yes, it's frightening. But sometimes walking away from a situation is far better than staying into it. Yes, it's still scary and you've got a lot of fear, but those are new fears and different things that can be overcome, and you can't overcome some of these things in, a, in a, an abusive relationship. No, you know, sometimes it's just uh, you, you're not going to overcome it, and, and uh, you get in that cycle of trying, and, and no matter what you do, it, it's going to fail because it's really on the other person to fix. Um, you know, is what, what can people... Within the law, we obviously don't want anybody uh, putting themselves at risk of breaking the law, but what can people do in that community to uh, wake people up other than talking about it? I mean, if if we have somebody going around posting pictures and a short description of this guy, um, you know, uh, uh, are they going to be in trouble for doing that? Can we, you know, what can we do? as a community, Bill, to, to uh, hold this guy accountable since the courts aren't going to, well, you know, I, without, you know, without taking physical actions or breaking common laws that we know of. But there, there must be some things we can do 
um, you know, such as, uh, you know, many of us calling the local police and say, you need to inform your communities. Um, you know, well, here's, here's a couple of things. Now, anything that I'm saying, you know, uh, talking to you that, you know, he confessed all of this, so that's the truth. Okay, so I'm not impeding or impugning anybody's integrity because it's the truth. Now, what's going to happen here is we will be impeding his treatment. Impeding his treatment. Yes. Okay, and, and so um, that would take – impeding his treatment. No, no, no. No, that's not true because um, in any type of treatment, uh, people are taught, whether it be alcoholism, domestic violence, whatever, um, people are taught that they have to hold themselves accountable and they have to be willing to not only confess but, uh, you know, face – Th that scenario, if, if asked by the, yeah, accept responsibility. If you walk by your neighbor and your neighbor says, hey, are you that guy that killed that girl? You're supposed to be able to say, yes, sir, I am, and, and, you, and, and, and have a conversation about it, right? Not turn violent because somebody asked, not feel like they're, uh, you know, stepping in uh, to your privacy, or any of that stuff, you're supposed to be to, to say that you're rehabilitated, to, to say that you've overcome it. That's one of the things that you have to do. So yeah. how come he how come he doesn't have to do that? Well, we have what is called the HIPAA Act. Now, in this case, the court records are sealed. Uh, the information out there available is available through the news media. Uh, this story went as far as San Francisco um, in the daily press and whatever affiliates they have. So it, it made a couple of major cities. So by telling that, we're telling the truth. Uh, anything dealing with his treatment, when he's going to be released, what, what they're going to do, if he's going to get permissions to go in town, that's all part of his treatment. And we're not to know any of that stuff because of the HIPAA Act. Now, you know, as a private investigator, if I'm looking for information, somebody wants me to do a background search on somebody, one of the first things I do is I go to the courts and I talk to the clerk of court and I give a name and I give a, a date of birth or, or a case uh, issue. And whatever information is there, they provide me copies of for a fee. Uh, and in this case, I'm not going to get any information because those court records are sealed. Yeah, well, that's that's an injustice in itself. I mean, I understand protecting people's uh, health records um, in most situations, but we're talking about a man that murdered somebody, is is showing signs of repeat behavior, is loose in the community, and the community's right to peace and safety and dignity go above. His treatment plan. That's, but I mean. This guy is such a smooth operator, and I don't want to get in trouble with this. So I have to word this kind of specifically. It is alleged that he was having sex with his social worker. Well, that's outstanding, and I wouldn't doubt it at all. I mean, it sounds like, one, he's a manipulator, and, and we know that those scenarios often do play out. Um, you know, doctor-patient relationships happen all the time, whether they're a one-time fling or sometimes a semi-lasting relationship. It, it does happen. I mean, um, you know, people get very close to each other in those situations, and if he's a you know, manipulator, and obviously he is. Um, sure, sure. So, so even his counselor really is at risk because um, we could see this as, as you know, uh, um, a sexual uh, deviation uh, in some way. You know, um, so she's at risk. She's allowing herself to be at risk, allowing her community to be at risk um, for some relationship that she shouldn't be having in the first place. Uh, you know, uh, for, on several levels, you know. First of all, you don't date killers, ladies. That's good. Yeah. just my recommendation. Don't date anyone that's killed anybody before. Um, yeah. You know, uh, if it was an accident, yes. I mean, the brakes went out on my truck and I hit somebody and it wasn't my fault. 
um, but somebody died. Well, yeah, okay, that that guy may be okay, you know, but um, you know the guy that j just uh, got high and got uh, sick of his woman griping about it, and uh, she wouldn't shut up after he smacked her. So the kitchen knife happened to be there, and he killed her. And then he's able to say, "Well, I lost my mind for a few minutes, Your Honor." And he, the judge says, "Okay, go to work at KFC." We can't have that. Okay, okay. we we have rights too. I understand. Uh, Walker has rights. As far as I'm concerned, the community has rights. Um, and, you know, w w safety is an issue, right? This country um, goes uh, all out to, to ensure our safety, right? Isn't that why we've been in perpetual war since the 40s or whatever? You know what I mean? Um, so safety uh, is priority um, according to the way we have lived in this country. But somehow, this guy is able to do these things, and there are people in danger right now. We can yep. assume that, um, you know, because he has killed once. He's repeating similar behaviors, um, and nobody is made aware of who he is, you know. Just uh, everybody or, or the majority of the people in that community knowing who he is, knowing uh, roughly what his schedule is. Okay, he works on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and he does this and he does that, and, and we know he's in the community, and he's usually in this type of car, and, and you know, uh, he looks like this, um, and, and who some of his connections are. If the community knows that, then everybody is just so much safer. You know what I mean? It, yeah. I, you know, early on during my information gathering, I managed to get a hold of the number of his therapist. I called his therapist and I explained who I was. I told a brief scenario of my daughter's story. And this person was in complete and total shock. You can hear the genuine shock over the telephone. And then they proceeded to tell me that they're very knowledgeable of this case. And I said, how can you tell me you're knowledgeable of this case when you expressed that genuine shock when I told you my daughter's story. What's that going to do for his treatment? Well, I can't tell you any of that information. I said, yes, I understand that. And I'm being very careful how I'm wording this. Yes, I understand that. That's not why I'm calling you. I'm calling you to let you know who I am and what he did. And now I find out that you really don't know what he did. Right, right, yeah. They they looked at a piece of paper and they knew it all, right? Right. Um, now I wanted to ask you, Bill, before I get past it, uh, he is still at Eastern State uh, Mental Facility. Is that right? He hasn't been yes. transferred anywhere. And to my knowledge, he's still at Eastern State, and that's in Williamsburg, Virginia. Right. And the town, though, that they lived in was um, Newport Newton. News. Newport News. Okay, so I want to make sure that people are aware of that because that's where the the crime committed, and obviously they probably have contacts there. So it's not just Williamsburg, really, that has to be on alert. Uh, you know, because oh. if he if he's unattended, right, he could just trip out to Newport News and maybe oh, knows it's, some. It's the entire Tidewater area. Uh, Newport News, Yorktown, uh, Pocosin, Surrey, Smithfield, Suffolk. Norfolk, Virginia Beach, uh, Hampton, uh, all of the cities around, you know, it's the, it's the Tidewater area, the peninsula, and, and beyond. Right, and that's, uh, you know, um, now this is what I think, Bill, you know, and I'm accountable, remember everybody, anything I say or do, I'm accountable for, but this is what I think I'm going to do. I, I, Virginia Beach, there's a lot of money to be lost if the tourists don't come, because the community... Uh, allows a killer to walk silently along the beaches, okay? Um, you want to protect your tourism? <laughs> right. uh, you, you need to protect your community because I, I'm gonna, I will take it upon myself in any way I can, this show and the archive of it, um, you know, as being one thing, and then I, I can suggest ideas for people um, that, that feel that we have to take this upon ourselves to inform the community, not to interfere with uh, Walker in any way. Don't assault him verbally or otherwise. Don't stalk him. Don't follow him around. But understand who he is. Know what the potential is. Uh, know where he goes uh, to a degree, you know. 
Uh, I don't want anybody to, um, you know, go visit the guy. I, I don't want anybody to come into his work if, he, if he's managed to get a job and do something worthy for once. Uh, then I don't want anyone to interfere, interfere with that. But I want everybody there to know exactly what's going on because someone else could die if not. Right. And, it, and we're not making this up, you know, we're not trying to, uh, it's not like uh, somebody uh, slept with my wife so I'm going to slander them. You know, this, this man murdered a, a, a woman who made friends wherever she went and had children and, and you know, was a happy person uh, and had goals and, and and he took her life, mer you know, without any mercy. Um, and again, the, the the thing about the repeat behaviors or the similar behaviors now, um, I mean, I guess that's why he wasn't fully released from the hospital, but that just means he, you know, he has to kill on a part-time basis. He can't go full-time with his murdering. He has to do it, you know, certain hours of the day, certain days of the week. That, that doesn't satisfy me, yeah. and it shouldn't satisfy anybody there. You know, I had I had considered doing a postcard campaign, you know, because everybody reads the postcards because they're not sealed, and sending postcards to wherever it was that he was, describing what he had done. Um, but I decided to let that go. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a hell of an idea, but it could could have been seen as a as a as a direct attack, I guess, Bill. <laughs> so that's good. I mean, you're you're a smart guy, and I mean. You know, this is such a, an emotionally charged thing. It's like that event must keep tormenting you every time you drive down certain streets, every time you hear certain things on the news, every time you see certain things on social media, even if it's unrelated to Virginia or your daughter. I mean, when you see anybody being harmed or any type of violence, it, it must trigger some of that stuff all over again, I would imagine. On a regular basis, we're coming into the holidays now, so it's real tough right now. Um, you know, not directly as a result of this, but I mean, I've had other issues, but but this 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 scenario with my daughter uh, has sent me into congestive heart failure, which will send me into pulmonary edema and respiratory failure, and and any number of other things. Uh, and I'm battling that, you know, because when this news report came out in June, it's like, oh shit here it is in my face all over again, and I just went through therapy dealing with all of this stuff. And guess what? It doesn't go away. You never get over it. I'm tired of well-meaning people saying get over it. If you haven't been through it, don't ever fucking tell me to get over it. Yeah, you're not ever going to get over it, Bill. You're not ever going to put, I mean, you know, on your passing day, you're still going to think about your daughter. That was your child. Yes. You know, that, and, that, you're not ever going to forget that. And, I mean, people need to understand that you are a very fair-handed man. We can tell from your speech. We can tell because you tried to help him. When you were earlier reviewing the fact that he did have a mental health issue, you, you kind of supported, um, in a sense, the, the, you know, the plea agreement or the sentence or whatever. There, there was some mental health issues but it's the idea of the structure of the sentence in uh, and, and the, you know, walker running around uh, unsupervised and the repeat behavior is what's really, I think, uh, bothering the most because you know that this is going to happen again within this no, system. No doubt in my mind. You know, there are some states that deal with it as guilty but insane. And I would like to see Virginia change those laws. Well, guess what? You're dealing with judges and lawyers and politicians and all of this stuff. I mean, you know, it cost over $1,000 to get a protection order. It's a piece of paper saying, don't bother me, stay away 500 yards or feet or whatever. That piece of paper didn't do a damn thing. Well, right. I'm glad you brought that up because we, we forgot to mention it. And ladies, you need to really listen to this, that there was a um, restraining order um, in place at the time. Um, so that piece of paper isn't going to do you a whole lot of good uh, with some individuals. Now, some individuals um, will obey a restraining order, but uh, most of the time, if 
they're a violent person, they don't really care about your peace, safety, or the law. And so a piece of paper, if you have to go to the point that you have gotten that piece of paper, the next thing you need to do is to get a few more pieces of paper, one of them being a concealed carry permit, and the other piece of paper is the uh, documentation that says you own a gun and know how to use it, because this is this happens, and and um, that's what I'm going to recommend. If, if you weren't able to break free and you got to the point that you needed to rely on the courts, they are not going to ultimately keep you safe, not Ladies. in every situation. Ladies, the longer you wait to get out of a domestically violent situation, the harder it's going to be to get out and the more dangerous it's going to be to get out. Here's my advice. If somebody has to hit you the first time, the very first time they get violent with you, that is the time to leave because it will continuously get worse. Yeah, it will. Um, and and you know, quite honestly, uh, the situation I lived in with my this this would apply uh, to men as well. And I'll throw it out there just because I it happened to me. You know, my ex-wife with her mental health uh, had um, you know peaks that were sometimes quite violent and aggressive um, and you know combative. And twice uh, she assaulted me, and I went to jail. <laughs> You know, it's not funny, uh, yeah. but 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 if you're dealing with a person who is physically abusive, there is a mental health issue, period. Yeah. You need to step aside until they handle that. If they handle it and time goes by and you're still in love and you recreate a relationship, that's fine. But you will not fix that problem, whether you're male or female, you will not fix it. And if they don't fix it, you cannot be with them. That's right. Unless you like to be abused. And, That's right. And, you know, um, I don't know anybody that ultimately likes to be abused. You know? Here in Virginia, if, if there is a domestic violence call and there is assault and battery, both persons get arrested here in the Commonwealth That's of Virginia. That's outstanding. And guess what? In the Commonwealth of Virginia, animal abuse carries a more stiffer punishment than domestic violence. Three domestic violence charges will then turn it into a felony. Two animal abuse charges turns it into a felony. So animal abuse carries a stiffer punishment than domestic violence or, or assault and battery in a domestic violence situation here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's horrifying within itself, Bill. I mean, is that... It, was it because there was a lot of animal abuse and so they cracked down on it because we see that happen? I'm, but I can't imagine in today's world that more puppies are being hurt than women. That, I, I, can't I, I, can't an, I can't honestly answer that question. I did not look into those statistics. Yeah, I, I, it just seems, well, it, it doesn't seem right. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, that that's kind of curious of how, how, why, but it, I, I guess a lot of laws in different places are, are you know, make you shake your head to say, how does this happen? Well, uh, who stands to lose the money? Right, that's, who, yeah. <laughs> who stands to lose the money? You know, $1,000 for a protection order. Come on, that's kind of high for a piece of paper saying stay away from me. Yeah. Then you've got, you got to go to the lawyer, hire the lawyer, pay her. Then you've got to go to the court. You've got to pay the court costs to make sure the judge gets paid, uh, you know, and for his ruling and all of these other things. Uh, who stands to lose the money when you change the laws? Right. Very, yeah, and I, I, it shouldn't be that difficult. Uh, there should not have to be an attorney involved and all this money uh, to to protect somebody. I mean, isn't that what we hired the, the system for? Yeah, I remember when we went to move my daughter out of her uh, out of the apartment they were living in, and she called me and she was a little on the frantic side, so I called the police, not knowing that the police had already been there two times. And when I get there, the police are there, and they're really kind of belligerent and hostile towards me. And I'm saying, Danielle, you said this. No, Dad, I didn't. I said, okay, well, Danielle, I apologize. That's what I heard. Then the cops started getting irate and belligerent with me. I said, hold up, fellas. I'm a Department of Criminal Justified 
a Department of Criminal Justice certified instructor. And then all of a sudden their attitude changed. And then my ex-wife stepped up and said, yes, I work for the Sheriff's Department. Then they all calmed down. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite uh, curious, isn't it? I mean, that's good that they calm down, but their reasoning for calming down is, is quite concerning. I mean, at that moment you were, you know, a father – uh, trying to help his daughter, you shouldn't have received any attitude at all, in my opinion. Yeah, well, that that's my initial impression, too. And then when we, they realized who we were and what our backgrounds were, then, yeah, okay, well, I'm a dad, too, and I got kids. I probably would have reacted the same way. But I didn't get that reaction until I told them who or what experience that I had. So, you know, it, it, this whole thing has been a nightmare from the beginning. And... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to, to – number one, I'm not ever going to see absolution. Number two, I'm never, ever going to see justice. Um, you know, somebody told me, don't worry about it, Bill. There's three forms of justice. I said, yeah, what's that? Man's justice, God's justice, and street justice. So, huh, okay. I didn't think about the street justice one. Right, yeah. Um, well, it, and now it's almost uh, been reclassified as Internet justice, um, you know, Bill, um, uh, which is powerful. And that's why I'm really glad uh, that you were able to do this uh, tonight for everybody because, again, you know, first of all, I, I, I believe that just being able to tell that story, have a place to do it uh, where you feel comfortable is, is healing. So I hope that this, you know, will serve to, to help you um, after all the shit you, you've been through in such a situation. But also, it's going to sit there, you know, and this story can, is retold every time somebody visits it. And for you, because I'm sure a lot of this stuff you'd like to not rehash. You're always going to have memories, but to go this deep into it, I'm sure, is something that you don't want to have to do so that you can make a new person aware. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because every time you try to help somebody and you're going to use this as a reference, you have to relive it and torment yourself, help someone else. And so let's hope this archive can be a tool for that where, you know, you can give someone that you just made a brief overview and then give them the link and, and yeah. they can listen to you, um, yeah. you know, and, and hopefully, folks, if you're listening to the archives, um, make sure you share this, you know, especially in the Virginia area, and come up with ideas. Um, there are photos available. There's links available. You know, share this information in the community. Um, I'm going to do a few things myself. A few phone calls won't hurt um, to a few key places. You know, uh, people need to start talking about this. Because um, certainly, Bill, you've been more than fair in your research, decision making related to this, um, you know, uh, nobody could twist this, in my opinion, as you trying to harm Walker. Uh, you're not. You're trying to protect your community. Um, you're trying to make sure that justice is served, and justice is not served if if the offender is um, enabled to repeat the offense or similar offenses or, or you know, violence in any way. One, one of the questions I have, having worked mental health, having seen some of the people with the same type of diagnoses come back because they stopped taking their medication, uh, having seen it time and time and time again, uh, let's say, God forbid, that Owen is released into the community because he is managed. He falls through the cracks of the system. He stops taking his medication. He ends up doing this to somebody else. Who is responsible? Who do we hold accountable for that? The people that treated him and released him? The system that set up these rules and regulations and laws? These lawmakers? Uh, who's responsible? You know, because obviously he goes back into court. He's not guilty by reason of insanity. He's done it once. Doing it again isn't going to change anything. Right. Yeah. The worst that would happen would be that he would um, be reconfined and maybe lose his free time out in the community. But really, there would be no punishment. Uh, you know, even after a second offense, it would be really not a lot different than it is right now. 
Um, and it's so hard, you know, to sue courts and jurisdictions. I mean, you know, the the cost, um, if you could even, because ultimately they are um, all partially responsible. You know, that yep. whole system, anyone associated with it, uh, if someone else is harmed, um, in my opinion, needs to be held accountable. Even the local police. If the local police aren't doing something to inform, they're there to serve and protect. And, and the best way that you could protect that community right now is to make everybody aware of who this man is, what he's done, and, and what what the boundaries are for him. Right. You know, and there's an open door on those boundaries. He can come in and out of it. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. And I mean, it might be different if you know he was, um, you know, working, but supervise okay he's able to take a job but there there is uh you know if he leaves the building uh, the boss knows and calls the sheriff's department immediately so that he's apprehended immediately if there were fail safes put in place but it it sounds to me like uh that there aren't any fail safes uh, as well, far as when he's in the community there's the conundrum because to do so is a violation of his HIPAA act now um what wouldn't be in violation of HIPAA Act is if um, he was to be wearing an ankle bracelet while he's in the community, right? Couldn't they at least do that and, and have him monitored when he's outside of the facility? I'm sure they could. That, that doesn't necessarily work. I've never seen that done. I'm not saying it hasn't been done. Uh, I, left, I left the mental health industry back in the 80s. Uh, so I'm not sure what changes have been made since then, but I've never seen it done. Well, I think it needs to be at the very least, right? If they want to him into the community, they have to guarantee the community that they are safe and that they know what Walker is doing every minute and where he is at every minute. If we're not allowed to know, then we have to be reassured that someone does not this man killed. And he's right. having, uh, he's exhibiting behaviors that say he will probably kill again. And so, I mean, I want, you know what I want? If they're going to allow him to go out and work, I want an armed guard on the site while he's there. That's well, what I want. Know. Just like a jail would be, right? If you're in jail for murder and you get to go out on the road crew and pick up trash, there's somebody ready to shoot you dead if you if you leave. Right. And And so how come Walker... Uh, it can can do that. I mean, if we're going to give him the leeway of insanity and getting mental health help so that he can rehabilitate himself, until he is rehabilitated, he's just, just as dangerous as he was in the moments that he killed your daughter. How come he's not under armed guard at the very least? Right. I don't even think Hinkley has an ankle bracelet. But I do know Hinkley is uh, scrutinized by the Secret Service. That's the only difference between these two cases. You know, I mean, uh, you could violate probation for any numerous simple offense um, that had re no real victim, and you could be walking around with an ankle bracelet, you know? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, it's, uh, it's quite ridiculous that somebody that murders and has been found insane is not at least fully monitored all the time. That's, I can't imagine that, and I mean... Uh, I don't know legally if there's something we could do to um, make sure that that happened, but we could certainly suggest it. We should. We could certainly repeatedly call the, the mental health institution and recommend it. We could. Uh, yeah, know, that's, uh, that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of work. Uh, getting together with like uh, the victims, uh, the domestic violence houses and the directors that sponsor and run those things and getting together with them and then getting together with the delegates and, you know, the House of Representatives and those people within the state. And that's a lot of time and a lot of hard work and a lot of travel to Richmond. Well, I, the thing is, is I, I think that um, with the power of the Internet and the power of suggestion and, um, you know, every person that sees this archive calls the hospital and calls the court and maybe I'll try to put together uh, in the archive folks as soon as this all processes or if you're looking listening now on YouTube look below in the show more there's going to be um, some information for you 
uh, you know, some phone numbers. Uh, but if these people were called, you know, by a couple people every day for the next year, uh, <laughs> maybe they would get sick of it um, and they would do something about it. Yeah. I mean, I think we, if if the community will react to the information uh, that you're giving us, Bill, and, and the suggestions and the ideas, uh, you know, and sadly enough, as you know, there are so many issues that the true activists fight that they don't have time to take on more, and the sheep aren't doing a damn thing to take care of themselves. Right. Um, but, but I want people to think, especially if you have a daughter, your daughter's at risk. Your, your grandchildren are at risk. Your community is at risk. And there are some simple things that we could do to keep you a lot safer. Informing the public, um, forcing somebody to, to put some closer uh, restriction, you know, spider restrictions on Walker. I mean, I'm all for if there's a chance to rehabilitate somebody, um, it, it, you know, I'm for uh, saving human life. But I have a hard time when you've taken a human life yeah. unnecessarily, even if it's because you're a drug addict, even because you knew all these things before you killed the person. We have to be responsible for ourselves, you yeah. know. And so it, it's not an easy one for me to swallow that anybody gets out of anything because they were insane. Yeah. Um, especially like I said now you know had Walker been in and out of mental institutions all his life and, and then finally you know after three failed treatments snapped and killed somebody um, and he's found you know uh, insane and, and given some light sentence then maybe I can think about it but that wasn't the situation I mean you saw times, the signs how many times do you send somebody to domestic violence classes before they understand, before they get the right. picture. Yeah, no, Once, one time, and then they need to be locked after that. You well, know? I mean, twice, maybe because of mistakes, three times, four times, five times. You know, that's. I, I just think that that's one way society says, here, look, this is what we've done about the situation. He went to the domestic violence class, and he passed. I used to, where, where, where I used to work, I used to, they had a, a domestic violence class uh, in the building, and I used to go take smoke breaks. And I'd stand out uh, in the smoke break area, and I'd listen to these guys laugh and joke about, you know, the only thing this is teaching them is how to use a telephone book, how to use this, how to use that. One guy even commented, you know, I got enough of these certificates that I can paper my bathroom with them. And it's like, geez. You know, they pay their fee, they do the thing, and then boom, they're released again. Right, yeah. Well, they're spreading the money out, Bill. You know, some of the money gets to be made by the people that run the prisons and then, you know, the other corporations in the community, the health care, the mental health care, the attorneys, they need to get a piece of the pie, too. So some of them we throw in jail. Well, the nonviolent ones, let's say, we'll throw them in jail, and then the violent ones will we'll keep on the street and, and, and you know, suck money uh, and chances are, you know, this is a burden on the community, too. You know, th we're paying, or the community there is paying uh, for this person who murdered uh, to be out there, you know, um, to take part in classes and to do all these things. And, you know, and, and what I really hate is that I saw in some of the information you sent me, and, you, and you've mentioned it tonight, that um, he's going to churches. You know, and this is what I saw uh, back in the day before I had kids when I'd get in trouble. These guys would get in trouble, and they knew that they could get their sentence reduced or they could manipulate the system if everybody thought that uh, Jesus had saved them. And right. so they would go to Bible study, um, you know, and as soon as they left Bible study, they'd go get high. Or well, whatever the case may be, you know, they right. go beat somebody up or whatever the case. And, and that whole religion thing, you know, um, it doesn't fly with me. It, it, it's it's a manipulation used by predators so that they can, you know, continue to, I mean, obviously he has some type of social life. He's a murderer in a mental hospital, and it sounds like he has a hell of a social life. He's able to post pictures on Facebook. He's able to date people. Uh, he's able to move from job to job at his leisure. 
you know, he can get a job, but he doesn't have to keep a job, it sounds like. That's not part of the, you know, who are his counselors that, that after he fails at three jobs are still going to let him out to try again? You need to reset, back up, fix the problem, and then go back up. Me. It doesn't sound like that's happening. Yeah, it's not. I remember my daughter maxing out her credit cards to get him tools so he could go to work. <clears throat> Got the tools, went to work a couple of weeks, and then said, screw it. And probably pawned the tools after the fact. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I've just seen it so many times, you know, um, that it just, I really hope the, the young ladies, uh, not only in that community, you know, in any community, are listening to this uh, and sharing this because, you know, ladies, um, Bill doesn't want, and I don't want any of you to fall into this, and we know that you are. Um, you know, every day we see it out there. Bill, you've done some stuff. I did watch a short video. You were on video trying to, um, uh, you know, uh, promote the uh, domestic violence education and that kind of stuff. Are there some resources um, in that community or, you know, nationwide that you want to point out so that people can rely on those and try to get themselves out of these situations? Well, I know in, in the Tidewater area, there's Samaritan House, and that's over in the Virginia Beach side. And on the peninsula, it's Transitions. Both of those uh, help women with domestic violence issues as far as housing, getting them jobs, getting them uh, you know, housing on their own instead of staying in, in a dormitory style. They're both super great. I've spoke for them on several occasions. Um, so in this area, you know, anywhere else, go to your phone book and look for domestic violence uh, abuse and, and find whatever shelter is out there. Uh, it's tough. It's hard. It's frightening. But it's far better being in a domestic violence shelter than it is being in a domestic violence situation. Yeah, it's scary, but I tell you what, that fear is a hell of a lot better than the fear of living in a domestic violence situation. I'm going to tell you that right now. Um, well, yeah, and what people need to consider, too, Bill, I think, especially if they're in that situation, it is scary to go across that threshold, so to speak. Once you're over there, you're now in a place where there are people that can help you overcome anything you need to overcome, but there's also you're surrounded by people that get you. They understand yeah. because they broke free, too. And so you see a lot of uh, close friendships formed, you know, and um, people helping each other because they understand each other. Like, as you know, as a parent, when you tell your child anything, there's kind of an automatic natural rebellion that occurs, even if you're close to your child. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. but when a person sees somebody else suffering like they have, and, and that person is befriending them and speaking to them, um, that, that's powerful. That, that new friend has more power than a parent does, or, or even um, an old friend, uh, yeah. you know, because I, I think that friends of your daughter's had spoken to her about this as well, and, and tried to, you know, tried to encourage her to get out, and so... Sometimes it's those new friendships um, from somebody that's just like you, you know, that really can be powerful uh, to, to help you uh, to, to yeah, get the in only there thing, now. The only thing I have that I can offer to anybody uh, when it comes to this is my experience, my strength, and my hope. Well, you're a hell of a man, Bill, too, uh, you know, because, again, I, I know that uh, tonight, even to get to tonight, was was very very difficult for you. I mean, we've we've kind of tried um, for almost a year now. I think it's been close to a year since uh, Jim Lee put me in contact with you. Um, you know, and, and I could tell. Uh, that's why I didn't push the issue or give you constant reminders because I could tell. First of all, you're an intelligent guy, um, and this is just a devastating topic. Uh, I couldn't even imagine. So that's why I kind of. Just uh, once every few months, let's say, hey, I'm s still here, but how are you? You know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. for you to come here tonight. This, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. 
I pray that nobody has to experience it, but unfortunately there will be people that will. Uh, you got any questions come off your uh, chat board? Uh, no, and you know what? Uh, I may have to get in. I'm having some uh, connection issues, and the listener count is down because the uh, YouTube constantly buffers, Bill. I don't know if somebody is DDoS attacking my router, but we have a fail-safe if the archive is choppy or, or um, no good, then I have a second recording through the phone call uh, app that we're using that I will re-upload. So no matter what, when the archive is ready, this will be a crisp, clear stream. Um, but we only had a couple of listeners listening. Some came and then they left because the stream kept breaking up. And so at this moment, I'm looking at YouTube, and it's telling us we have bad stream health. It may be that um, the archive doesn't come out that well, but uh, I will uh, get the MP3 and reformat everything and get a, uh, a clean archive up, and it will be up tonight. So um, anybody that is listening over there at YouTube, I'm sorry for this. Uh, that's why I put the system in place exactly because – um, with the other stuff that I do, Bill, you know, I'm under constant attack. And when I had the live shows before, people were attacking a remote server, and they could really raise hell with yeah. the shows. The way I do it now, it's being recorded, broadcast through YouTube, which they can't shut down. They can't shut down the free conference calls app, which is also recording the only thing I will lose is the music that I played at the beginning of the show, which, but um, from the minute that you came on, um, that archive is being recorded on another website. So um, that's why I set things up this way, uh, along with this is a, a free way to do things, um, but it's, they can still attack my router and interrupt my transmission from my home to the internet. So okay. that. That may be what's going on now, um, but either way, uh, we will have by tonight sometime a clean archive that's sitting on YouTube, and I will link you to that um, as soon as possible. Um, so I'm not sure, and if I try to play with any of the settings, I'm going to disrupt everything. So I, I'm just letting it go so I don't interrupt um, you know, the recording of the show or whatnot. And it may be that it will buffer as YouTube is archiving it, I won't have to re-upload or, or create a video format. Um, if I have to create, it will be, you know, four or five hours before it's fully uploaded. If YouTube has caught all the information with a week stream, then it should be ready in about an hour. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's and that's another way. It's a great, uh, I have the live broadcast through YouTube, so it makes it really easy for me. Uh, I used to spend four to six hours after the show creating a video and getting it uploaded. Now I don't have to do that. Uh, wow. But again, because, because of some of the other stuff I'm involved with, there are some attacks. Um, you know, but make note, they still have not hacked my website and my computer is fine. Um, they did DDoS my router, but it, uh, any 13-year-old can do that. So that's really not... Um, not effective. Uh, is there anything else uh, before we wrap up that, that we didn't touch on? Bill, I mean, you've been so thorough. I'm amazed by you, by the way. Uh, you. To be so composed, and now I understand, you know, it, it's five years. This is your child, you know, and I know, um, you know, when, when even me looking at my kids, they're good kids, but they're a little bit rebellious, they're teenagers, and when I see some of the things they're doing, you know, I know that if they don't change it soon, they're going to suffer consequence, and there's a lot of anxiety related to that, and, and you know, a lot of uh, beating yourself that, oh man, maybe I should have done this, or I should have done that, or all these things that parents go, if you're really a, a loving parent, all these things parents go through. Uh, yeah. And, and so I can't even imagine uh, really what you're going through. I mean, it, it's an honor to, to have you here. And I hope that people will really take the time to share this because you're not doing this for yourself. Um, yes, we hope that this 
it w will in some way help you. Uh, you s you've suffered. You you deserve help. Uh, but but you do this more because you don't want to see the headlines of, of a repeat story. Uh, you know, it, uh, and those ki those grandkids. I mean, uh, I, I really think that the courts uh, and everybody involved need to consider that. Uh, you know, those kids are still going to come up, and, and their paths could cross with this man, and they may have to relive all this. Um, and, and we still cannot be 100% sure that someday he might take some action against those kids. Yep. Um, That's my concern. You know, I, we would hope not. We, we would hope not. But we, we hope that he wouldn't have heard anybody else, and, and we're here now, so it doesn't at, do at a whole lot. At the present lot. time, there is a court order that he's not to have anything to do with those two children until the age of 18, and then it's their choice. But there again, that's a piece of paper. Right. A couple of other things that I didn't touch on early on. I remember, and, and it just flashed across my mind, and especially dealing you know, with the people listening, I remember that when the first responders showed up between, you know, fire rescue and the police, it totally devastated these guys. And then originally they had uh, said some things to their family, and their family had posted some things on Facebook. Well, those, those, those entries were then later deleted because of the sensitivity of what they were talking about. Uh, but here's a three-year-old child, female, standing over top of her mother, trying to wake her up. Come on, Mommy, wake up. We've got things to do. And here's the first responders come walking in and see and hear that. And her mother's, her, her mother's laying dead on the floor. She bled to death. A couple of the guys, you know, kind of lost it and, you know, uh, did the tears thing and all of that. And, and I remember we were to go clean up my daughter's apartment and get the things out of the apartment. Uh, I walked in the apartment. I turned the corner and see where she had laid, and I totally lost it, and I had to leave. So I collected nothing of hers. And, of course, then later was never offered anything of hers, but that's okay. Uh, and then that day ended up in the hospital. Uh, so I was in the hospital for two weeks. Uh, and I think that the hospital staff diagnosed me with double pneumonia and a couple of other things, and they basically saved my life. Because I don't know if I could have handled the viewing, and I don't know if I could have handled the funeral. Uh, I understand there was about 500 or so people, maybe more, that showed up to the funeral. Uh, and you know, if it wasn't for those issues and how things played out, I, I don't know where I would be. Because I was an emotional basket case. Uh, every once in a while I break down into tears, no longer like I used to. Uh, now I could talk about this uh, mo more coherently in hopes that I can save somebody's life, telling my daughter's story. You know, I, I would like to think that this is not about me. Well, yeah, in some ways it's about me because I want to use her story to tell the story and save somebody's life. I remember speaking for the law department at Hampton University. And several weeks after that speech, I got uh, a telephone call, and I uh, was asked to go into one of the professor's office. And they sat me down and told me to thank, they thanked me for saying what I said and doing what I did. And there were two confirmed <coughs> uh, domestic violence issues that were not resolved but taken care of as a result of that. So, uh, yes, Bill, your story and your daughter's story has helped people, and that's – all I needed. Do I want to do these stories? No. But if they call up and ask me, I will go do the story. No, that's that awesome uh, that you are because again, you no, know, um, and that's kind of why I I keep doing what I do. You know, it's because if you could just save that one person, you know, you you have some worth, and, and you know that this wasn't all uh, for naught. You know, um, it's sad that we live in a world that someone has to die to stop others from dying. But if that's all we have, um, we we have to make the, the best of it. You know, that's yeah. the only uh, uh, right thing to do. Um, you know, otherwise there's going to be more and more, uh, you know, Owen Walker's running around. Uh, I, but I am, again, I amazed by you, Bill, because uh, I, I can't imagine um, – 
you know, because I've been single dad almost uh, 11, 12 years now, you know, and, and the crap that I had to deal with with my ex-wife still, I have to keep myself in check, you know what yeah. I mean, as far as letting that affect my, uh, you know, happiness or, or decisions or anything else. Um, and, and so I know that issue has bothered me to keep that in check. I can't even imagine having to go to where you are and where you've gone and, and have to deal with the loss of a child under these circumstances and, and then to know that justice was not served, that that the community is not protected, those grandchildren are not protected, um, you know, the family has not received justice, your daughter has not received justice, those kids have not received justice. Um, you know, it's disgusting to me. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Um, and, and here's a bastard that can see his mother, can see his child from another relationship, can have visitation, can have all of those things that I'll never have again. Yeah, and I don't understand. Again, I really don't understand. In fact, I, when I get time, I'm going to call the the police department uh, in that community and ask why they're not informing. Why is this man not as dangerous to the community as a sex offender? Right. You know, I mean, sex offense is horrible. It's traumatizing. We have to do things about it, and we are. But you can murder somebody. And based on your mental health status, um, you can remain anonymous among yeah. the community. No, yeah. no, I don't. I don't care about HIPAA law. I personally don't. I, I, I personally don't. Um, so let that be fair warning, you know, um, because I'm going to put out information in the way that I see fit. And uh, if if anybody should be upset at me, Walker's family or otherwise, feel free to you know fill out a warrant. But I'm going to do what I think needs to be do, uh, done, rather, uh, because there, there's a community at risk. There's, there's a young lady at risk right now. Um, yep. uh, there, there's numerous, probably, if I had to guess, uh, there's probably more than one lady at risk because guys like this generally have at least two going at a time, right? Well, he's, um, it, he's, he's a self-professed man whore, so yeah, there's probably three or four in the shadows. Right, yeah, there's a there's a target list, I'm sure, somewhere on Facebook, probably. You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't think that, you know, if he ha is able to have access to Facebook and it's justified to be able to communicate with family, that's fine, but somebody else should be monitoring it. Um, you know, in my opinion, in my opinion, he should be monitored 24 hours a day if, if you've justified allowing him to leave a locked facility then he needs to have a bracelet on, or a sheriff escort, one of the two. I mean, the community is not safe, it, it, I, you know, and not that the ankle bracelet is a full answer, but, but I think it's a reasonable request, yep. you know. Um, yep. I don't know how we make that happen, but I'm going to think about it. I'm going to actually uh, talk with uh, my friend Craig Kirk. He's very wise in the law and see uh, if he has some resources that I could learn from and see what I can do about it. I mean, yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, when, when off air or at a later time, I, I can give you some information uh, that I don't want public at this point that might yeah, be able absolutely. to help you out with that. Yeah, that's great, Bill. And um, my secure email, and I'll just put it out here for other people, if you need to send me sensitive information, folks, master of many things at riseup.net. Um, I also have master of many things at Yahoo for general communication. But if there's sensitive information that you feel uh, others might want to look at, I don't fully trust Yahoo. I don't think anybody does. Um, so send it to the Rise Up account, and that'll be uh, a, a better way to communicate. Um, and certainly, Bill, yeah, any information you have, because I, you know, the, as far as I'm concerned, uh, for me, uh, this isn't done at the end of this. I myself will will take other actions, will encourage others to take other actions. Um, again, this archive is going out there. It'll get shared, you know, fairly regularly throughout social networks. I'm going to ask other people to share. Uh, I'm going to put some links below 
both phone calls uh, were. And I do want people to be cautious and, and fair-handed, as Bill has been. It, um, I think everybody can tell that you're a very fair man, Bill. Um, you know, and, you're, and this isn't about vengeance. This is about justice. This is about protecting a community and, and really nothing more. Um, do I want vengeance? Know. Yes. Oh, sure. Yes, it's natural. Everybody does. Um, but, you know, uh, sure. Absolutely. Everybody does. And that's something you're going to have, again, you're going to have to fight and deal with that for the rest of your life because of the actions of another, you know, and, and that's not fair to you. Uh, it's not, you know, you, you didn't sign up for this. <laughs> no. You no, know, uh, certainly not. Um, no. And, and I think, you know, and I, and I get so irritated because I look at the justice system and I see how many people it imprisons, uh, you know, unjustly uh, day after day after day. And I hear this story. Yeah. And it's very clear to me. That this man should be in in a locked facility, whether it's a jail or a mental health institute, it needs to be locked. He needs to be monitored all the time. Beyond that, I, I have nothing to say about it because you know I wasn't there, I didn't live it, I don't know him, I, I, I don't have all the details in front of me, but I have enough in front of me to know that this man is a predator who needs to to be monitored all the time. Otherwise, the community is not safe. That That's a black and white, one plus one equals two thing to me. And I think others that hear this will, will agree. You know, nobody's going for blood here. Nobody's, you know, uh, asking for, for more than basic justice and safety. Well, and, and my if, desire is to be a thorn in his side for as long as I can. And yeah, well, I mean, somebody has to, uh, you know, he does have to remind of this, and I think any good therapist would say to to Walker that, you know, these people are actually doing you a favor, because when you can go out into the community that hold you accountable without, you know, inappropriate actions, then you'll know you are rehabilitated. Do I personally think that that's possible for a man like this? No, I don't. I don't think it, it, he's already manipulated the system. He's going to continue to manipulate the system. He's selfish, not narcissistic, maybe. A Ooh. threat, definitely. You know? Definitely. Um, All of the above. It, well, and it's obvious that we, the community, have to stand up and protect ourselves from this stuff because the system has not. They've, they've proven that they will not. They refuse to take appropriate action. So we we have a right. We're human beings. Uh, as communities, humans, we have a right to take certain actions to ensure that we live in peace and safety. Yep. You know, and on so on paper, on paper, it looks like they're doing everything they're supposed to, but in reality, it's not how it's working out. Yeah, well, and, and what they're supposed to do, um, you know, that according to their rules, that doesn't mean. Know ethically uh, doing what they're supposed to do, uh, right. you know, because ultimately you and those kids and your ex-wife and the the friends and family of your deserve justice. It hasn't been served. The community deserves peace and safety. That ha that isn't happening. And the sad thing is, is because of the other protocols, most of the community probably doesn't even know. Not at all. I'm surprised at how many people are aware, only because uh, there have been people that kept this story going. You know, uh, News Channel 3, you know, the CBS affiliate here, uh, they've kept this story going since 2010. So if it wasn't for them, I don't think a whole lot of people would be aware. Uh, uh, there, there wouldn't be as many people as aware. Because this guy that did this story in June, I don't know him from Adam. Uh, don't know who he is, never met him, never seen him. So and now he's aware of the situation. He's concerned for what he sees. The people in the group that they meet in, they're concerned for what they see. Uh, and, you know, they're trying to get this girl to see what they're seeing, and she's not seeing it. Right. Well, you know, hopefully um, those same people that kind of are on point in keeping an eye on the situation, Bill, we can, you know, 
through osmosis, contact them uh, and have them, you know, share this as well. And uh, I have a site, I'm going to link below, a site that is awesome because it'll put you into contact with all of the major newspapers in any location in this country. So if people wanted to take the time to email local newspapers uh, throughout the state of Virginia, you know, uh, I'll do the same, put together an email list and, and refer them to this archive, um, you know, and uh, just so that here we need the community informed. We need his picture in the newspapers. We need the story out there. We need people to understand that this man is in their community unsupervised and is exhibiting behaviors that tell some of us that he will repeat these type of offenses. And um, I don't think that's stretching it very far, do you? No doubt in my mind, 100% uh, on point. You know, uh, to change the subject just slightly, for women that are in domestic violence situations, there's a poem that was written. It's called, I Got Flowers Today. Uh, you can do a search on Google or Startmail or whatever search engine you choose. I can't remember who the author was. Please read that poem. That will definitely put things in proper perspective. You know, because from the, the way it goes, and, and I'm kind of going off the top of my head here, uh, the first set of flowers she got was because they had a fight. Then the next set of flowers they got because she got beat up. Then there was another set and another set. And the last set of flowers she got was at her funeral. But I got flowers. That's, uh, I will try to uh, find that link and put it below, uh, Bill, and watch it myself. I haven't seen that. Um, and it just it sounds like that, that would have a pretty heavy impact um, for anybody you know, I really, I really hope that people are in this situation will grab a hold of this and not only, you know, say, hey, um, this is what's going on with me. I better get out now, you know. Yeah. Uh, but also just, you know, folks, if you're listening to the archive, hit those share buttons. You don't know who is out there in your social network. There, there could be one among your stream of people right now that, that, that just got smacked last night, just got the restraining order. Her boyfriend could be two blocks away heading in that direction right at the moment that you hear this, and sharing it just might get her out of the house in time. It might get her on the phone in time. Um, so please think about that. Take the 30 seconds to share it because you really don't know. Uh, you know, on social networks, people hide these type of things. As you know, Bill, you know, I'm sure your daughter tried to hide some of these things and only came to you when it was extreme, and she really needed somebody to help her. But um, she she wasn't giving you the play-by-play. -play. You didn't really have the full story to be able to see how critical the situation was. I mean, I'm sure you had red flags, but you didn't ever she hit think it very that well. Yeah, and, and generally that's that's the case. Nobody, I mean, first of all, we don't want to think about our children being murdered. And, and you know, um, so that's not something we're going to actually assume. You know, even if we think things are a little bad and we, and we you know, know that the, there might be a little bit of physical abuse, I don't think our first reaction is, oh, well, he hit her, he's going to kill her. That's not, you know, even... As parents being concerned, I think we'd say, well, I hope she gets out of there soon, you know, uh, you, or things like you can't allow him to do that to you. But I don't think we really get the reality that this can lead to murder. Yeah, you know, exactly. It, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. But, it, it, but it's a very hard pill to swallow, Kevin, because I've never hit a woman ever. And I just, I just don't understand it. I remember when my daughter was in middle school, she came home crying because boys at the bus stop were throwing rocks and glass at her. And I went to the school with a complaint. And the counselor had made a comment, well, Mr. Kinnar, you have to understand, that's just how boys are. I said, excuse me? You're advocating violence from these young men? How are they supposed to know they're not supposed to do this if we don't correct it now? So you're saying right. it's okay to be violent to show your appreciation to a young woman. That's totally wrong and unacceptable. What are we going to do to change this? And I demand change. That, that's incredible. I mean, uh, 
you know, it, well, and we see where society's gone, right? Abuse is on the rise. Uh, young women being exploited in many different ways on the rise, and then we wonder why, right? But uh, exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, if, we, if we accept that treatment, if we accept that, then everything's going to be on the rise, and that's not tolerable or acceptable behavior, in my opinion. And of well, course, these... I think uh, we may have lost Bill. Bill, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, okay. I I had a, I thought I heard a, a a fade out of the of the phone uh, there. Yeah, from I've one. been hearing clicks in the background, but you're, I'm still here. You're still here. Yeah, and I did. We it is somebody uh, trying to hit my router. We got a good stream back for a little while, and then it went back to uh, a bad stream health from YouTube. So somebody is trying to stop the show, but again, Bill, that they're not going to do that. The system that's in place, if YouTube didn't get a good enough signal to archive the whole thing, um, it is being recorded by free conference call. So I will download the MP3 from them, turn it into a video, get it back up there. Um, I know that, I don't know if you're uh, at, at the chat room or whatever right now, but I have uh, uh, Walker's photo uh, was the screenshot while the first 15 minutes the music was playing, and I've I've been running the screenshot of the chat room since then. But his photo will be out there. Um, I'll put some links uh, for people where they can pick up that photo, save it, print it. You know, you can print on paper a photo, folks, and you could write on there, you know, name and, and a few facts, and you could random. We pin those up at laundry mats, and you know anywhere you are, you see a yard sale sign, uh, stop, go read the yard sale sign, and pin his photo up there uh, with a, a brief description. Uh, we can do that. That's not against the law. Uh, okay, we we have no agreement with anybody that that uh, HIPAA does not apply to me. I, I'm not a caregiver. I'm a human being that's had enough of the bullshit, and I'm not going to stand for it. I have no agreement to protect anybody's privacy. Uh, I'm not bound by those laws that people succumb to as far as I'm I'm concerned. I'm going to share information that keeps my community safe. And if my community wants to arrest me for that, then go fill out a warrant, and I'm at 945 Southeast Ford Street in McMinnville, Oregon. Um, you know, that's that's how we got to handle these things. Um the healthcare providers might not be able to release the information. That's fine. I'll do it for them. You know, that's the type of attitude I hope people will grab a hold of in these situations. We're not trying to harm anybody here, folks. We're, we're trying to protect a whole community. And, you know, an individual uh, in their rights does not uh, always outweigh the needs of the community when life is at stake. You know, I mean, I wouldn't ever violate Mr. Walker or anybody else for the benefit of the community. Mr. Walker violated the community. That's that's the difference uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know. So, you know, hopefully people, again, share the video, uh, put up some information, call your local newspaper. If you haven't seen this story in your local newspaper and you're near this community, call them up. Email them. Say, well, how come you haven't informed us of this? Because along with the courts and the police, the media has a responsibility as well to inform the public of, of the news. Um, and, and this is news. You know, this is news. Um, and it's current news because this man is still repeating behaviors that he shouldn't be taking part in, like the Facebook postings, and, and, and God knows what, um, I'm almost, you know, scared to ask what he's involved with, uh, because I want to assume the worst with this, you know? Um, yeah, yeah there, were, there were postings on Facebook that were so risque that they could not even show them on TV. I, I read that, yeah. Uh, oh, actually, I heard that, because I, I reviewed the stuff that you gave me, um, and I listened to uh, a bit of the video with 
the gentleman that had just kind of got the story revisited here recently because he's worried about uh, his female friend who Walker is involved with now or was recently or whatever the case may be. Um, so I listened to some of that. Uh, you know, and that, uh, I've interacted with you off and on for about a year, and then when I listened to that guy's story, it's the same story you told me, Bill. Yeah. It, it's very similar to the story you told me. And, and now we have to believe that this guy, um, you know, is on the edge of, of repeating the same thing, another murder. Rather, uh, he's doing it intentionally or not, I don't know. And I don't care. Honestly, it doesn't matter whether he's thinking in his mind, I'm going to target another woman and I'm going to murder her, or if he's just repeating behaviors that he doesn't ultimately recognize. I could give two shits. I, it doesn't matter to me. The, the end result is the same. Someone's going to die. An innocent person is going to die. Children are going to be left fatherless, motherless, whatever the case. The, the, this can't happen. We have to, we the community have to do this. The system we relied on it. It failed. We have rights as well, and, and we have the right to peace and safety. Uh, and that's why we live here, right? Isn't that why we allow all, all craziness that's going on? It's because we think it's for our peace and safety. So uh, that's not happening. And, right. and so we have to make it happen. You know, if we don't, right, uh, the person that listens to this, and I don't wish harm on anybody, but I want you to think about this. If you were the person that listened to this story and you didn't hit share, and then your neighbor gets harmed because of because you you didn't share it you're going to know that and you're going to feel that you know take that responsibility share the information do the little bit that you can do to protect your community and if it's a share if it's a phone call if it's an email if it's the printing of walker's photo uh you know with the state hospital phone number and his current job or whatever information um i'll dig around i haven't found a lot i did run a docs on walker a while back but like you said uh the information is censored all the information is irrelevant now none of the phone numbers are current um so i didn't put out any of that information you know what i mean because it's going to uh, exhaust people's energies, but right. um, we certainly do know that he's uh, at the Eastern State Mental Hospital. We can call them. We can email them. Uh, we know the phone numbers and the faxes and the emails to all the local police departments. We can call fax and email them and demand that they uh, make the community aware. Uh, we can do all kinds of stuff uh, like that. You know, there's some of that information out. So. I will gather as much of that as I can once this archive is ready and put it in the show more. So just look down, folks, uh, if you're listening to this on um, the archives, and, and use that information that I put down below to, to take some form of action to help your community. Uh, and, and anybody that's willing to do anything, it is sincerely, deeply appreciated, and I thank you. Now, Bill, I'll ask before we close or actually I'll, I'll ask you off air um, not a big deal but uh, just some other information I may or may not put below um, okay have we touched on everything that you wanted to touch on is there anything else you want to get out there before we wrap things up well it's kind of like what I can think of it didn't go exactly how I planned but uh, I said what I had to say well uh, the I mean, I am not going to limit you in any way. If there's something we want to revisit, something else you want to talk about, friend, this is your place to do that, and we will stay here until uh, you're satisfied. Oh, no, I'm, I'm satisfied with now, and uh, maybe there's another date, you know? Well, there certainly is. You, you would always be welcome. We'll revisit this at any time, um, you know, any, any time at all, Bill. Uh, you know, if, if there's something you think of, um, just get it to me. Uh, if we want to get back on here, maybe there's an update. Uh, maybe we come up with a formal plan, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, you, you're always welcome. We'll always uh, set time aside for you. And um, it, like I said, as soon as uh, we're done here and the archive is ready, I'll make sure that you have the link so that you can share that 
you know, um, and hopefully that'll be a tool for you as well so that you don't have to keep reliving this to the degree that you have been because I know it's been a torment for you and, and you have, like a soldier, um, fought uh, this entire time that I've known you and, and seemingly the entire time in general. And even before the incident, you were there for your daughter. You risked yourself uh, by giving up your monies, your medications to try to help her, uh, with your information, you know, you're a good dad. Um, you did all you could do, and you're still going, um, and that's that's honorable. I have a lot of respect for you. Um, I thank you. The, well, hopefully, the community will react to that in respect of you as well. To uh, you know, share this information, and uh, and and hopefully, it'll go a long way to keeping somebody safe. I certainly uh, hope so. Uh, I really do appreciate your time and your effort in this, and uh, I will continue to keep this thing going. I'm actually going to start posting. Uh, Printing posters too. Oh, that's awesome! Well, there, there you go. Well, see, we can uh, when we speak, Bill, and get together and take things in our own hand. We really can accomplish a lot as common people with with simple tactics, you know. But people in general have lost sight of that, and that's why I I, I like the the talk radio platform because I'm a simple guy, man. I I was raised, uh, you know, on carrying water from a spring in an outhouse. Uh, I, I'm nobody, but when I learned these few tricks, and I, I said, "Hey, a guy like me, a, a nobody from the hills of New Hampshire, I can speak to the entire planet right now." That's powerful. You know what yeah. I mean? That that's a big deal to the simple person. And if we get back to, I look out at the world, you know, and and, and all the answers that I find are back to the one plus one is two. They're all very simple, and there's a lot of simple things that we can do. Um, and, and we can take control of our country, our towns, our money, our health, all these things, you know. So that's kind of why I do this. Um, you know, hopefully it's seen as, as, in a way, as my give back. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I enjoy the hell out of it because it puts me into contact with people that are just truly honorable, you know. And uh, you, my friend, one of those people. Oops. So I guess um, unless uh, you know you have anything else you want to put up there, we'll we'll wrap up the show. We're right up at about the two-hour mark. Um, okay. I want to appreciate anybody that did suffer through the fluctuations in the stream. I know uh, most of you left, and I don't blame you. The sound was cutting in and out. But if you listen to the archive, uh, please share this information. Support Bill. Uh, if you want to get in contact with Bill, just, uh, you know, get a hold of me. I'll kind of try to be a filter because I'm sure people on the other side of the fence may try to, to, to harass or attack or threaten, and I won't have that. So I'll kind of be a filter for that, Bill. You know, if somebody contacts me, I'll let you know who they are, what they said, and then it'll, you know, uh, I certainly don't want to give out any of your direct contact info um, unless you want it out there. And then not at, put, not at the moment. Right. No, I don't blame you because we know how these things go as well. Um, but if you do have a message for Bill, um, you know, just leave it in the comments below. I'm sure Bill will check in and, and read them there uh, or send them to me, and I will relay them to Bill so that uh, he knows what your feelings, thoughts, questions are, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Bill, my friend, uh, we'll call it an evening. Um, I want to thank you for your time and your dedication. Um, you know, your grandchildren, when they look back at this, are, are you know, they're going to remember their grandfather, and um, you, you're laying down uh, a structure, you know, and, and you're you're walking the walk that so many need to. So um, you're doing the right thing, and, and it's an honor to, uh, you know, just to know you and to be able to interact with you. Thank you. It's an honor to know you, and I thank Jim Lee for the introduction. Absolutely, yes. Uh, we got to give props to, to Jim Lee, everybody. Uh, Jim Lee, uh, webmaster of climateviewer.com, um, just a geoengineering uh, expert, in my opinion, and a great, great human being. Uh, some of you may know him also as Resonated, but Jim, if you're listening, shout out. Much love to you, uh, brother. And um, Bill, um, I guess we'll see you out there on the social web. Uh, love and prayers to you and your family, and, and thank you. I, I know that your effort um, has probably already kept 
uh, someone safe, and it will continue to do so now because of the effort you, you put into this. Thank you, Kevin. My love and prayers and everything back to you. Uh, it's an honor to get to meet and know you and to do this radio show, and I thank you for your time and effort. Well, you're very welcome. And to the listeners, thank you guys as well for all your support. Um, we'll be back tomorrow night. I'm so excited. The kickoff of Wake Up Call, a new weekly newscast open forum. We'll talk about current stuff. We'll, we'll show you how it relates to stuff in the past. And I will be um, assisted by my, and this is the first time I've ever had a consistent co-host. It's usually me out here all alone, but uh, my brother from the East Coast, Wix Sack Inf Bros, he will be the co-host uh, every Friday. We'll be here with you guys for a couple hours, maybe more, who knows. Depends on how much interaction and how much news there is. So we'll see you again tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. To you, Bill, uh, thank you. To the listeners, much love, uh, many thanks, and we'll 